before we get into the video today, I just want to give a quick shout out to one of our sponsors, Gnostic TV. Gnostic TV is ancient wisdom reimagined. This is a Netflix for those who are spiritually curious and want a place to go where there is no censorship. I personally am doing a whole series on Gnostic TV called the Esoteric Explorer, where I am providing exclusive content to Gnostic. Gnostic TV is a host to all sorts of different content creators, many of whom are your old favorites. If you would like to check out Gnostic TV, there is a link down in the description box below. In 2005, Elizabeth Kostova released her fictional novel, The Historian. The Historian follows a professor and his 16-year-old daughter as they discover information about the ancient order of the dragon and the missing body of Vlad the Impaler. It is safe to say in our modern times that no one haunts us quite like Vlad the Impaler. And even though this novel was pure fiction, there is some truth to it. But before we go any further, you know what to do. Please hit that subscribe button and give us a like. As always, such a very, very special, special thank you to all of our producers and our patrons on this channel. Without you guys, I truly would not be able to do what I do. Thank you so, so very much. If you would like to join our Patreon and our producer community, there is a link down in the description box below. Welcome to Esoteric Atlanta. My name is Bryce, and today on Mystery Monday, we are going to be talking about the curse of Vlad Dracula. Vlad Dracula, or Vlad III, was born November-ish of 1431. He was the second legitimate son of Vlad II, who ruled Wallachia from 1436 to 1447. Now, Vlad III's father, Vlad II, was the illegitimate son of Mircha I. At this time of Wallachia, which is now modern-day Romania, there was a lot of land disputes between Hungary, the Ottoman Empire, which we're going to get to in a little bit. In the time of Vlad II, Vlad III's father, it was customary sometimes within European nations for there to be um, a hostage, like a civil hostage situation. Such was what happened to Vlad II. Vlad II's father, Mircha I, sent his son, Vlad II, Vlad III's father, so Grandpa sent Dad to basically be kind of a, a, a hostage in the court of the King of Hungary, Hungary being a neighboring territory. And this was basically to show Wallachia's allegiance to the Hungarian court. Now understand that in these hostage situations, these boys or children that were kept basically as collateral were not treated as hostages. They were very much um, treated like guests and, and they were given educations and court values and stuff. So it wasn't it wasn't like like a, 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 what you might think of as a hostage situation. It was more of a collateral that, hey, we have your child, so you better be loyal to us. And again, Mircha the first handed over grandpa handed over dad in order to show his loyalty to the kingdom of Hungary. But in this time when Vlad the second, Vlad the third's father was being held as collateral in the Hungarian court, he was exposed to a secret society and became an initiate into the secret society. This secret society was called the Order of the Dragon. 
Now, it is said that the Order of the Dragon was a group that was created in the Eastern European area to help push back against the Turks or the Ottoman Empire who were coming in with their Islamic ways. Now, if you know me or if you're like me, I got some questions about that because I don't, I don't know if that's actually true. I don't know if anything they tell us is actually true, but nonetheless, that would have to be a story from another day. But this is how the important part of this is how the name Dracula came about. Vlad II then became Vlad Dracula, meaning that he carried the Order of the Dragon, which again, allegedly speaking, was this Christian society of Eastern European noblemen who were going to do whatever they could to push back against the Islamic Ottomans. Now, in modern Romania, Dracu means devil. So some people say this doesn't necessarily indicate the order of the dragon, but more the son of the devil. So at this point, Vlad II is now carrying basically the surname of Dracula, one that he will pass down to his children. Now, like many of the stories that we've covered as of late, there's going to be a lot of military warring going on throughout the, the entirety of this story. However, I am not going to go into great detail regarding the military strategy and details of the wars. If that is something that you are interested in, if military history is something that interests you, there are a lot of great podcasts out there that do go through in depth into the details between all the struggles between all these Eastern European territory, as well as the struggles with the Ottoman Empire. For the purpose of this story, I'm just going to skim the surface surface of what was going on militarily to get to the point of this story, which is the curse of Vlad the Imp Impaler. And the parts of the military history I'm going to cover are going to feed into the curse and then later the missing body of Vlad. So I hope that makes sense. Once again, if military history is something that you're really interested in, there's so many great historians and podcasts out there that can go into really great detail over everything that was happening at this time. Needless to say, at some point, Mircha I, the ruler of Wallachia, did obviously pass away. And we know that Vlad II, the dad of Vlad III, was an illegitimate child of Mircha. So there was some stuff going on that eventually gave Vlad II the reins of Wallachia. Now, Vlad III was the second born, born child. Vlad II had four sons, is what they believe, three of which were legitimate. The first son, Vlad III's oldest brother, was also a man named Mircha. He was named after his grandpa. So this was Mircha II. Then became came Vlad III, and then came the younger brother, Radu. Now, the fourth brother was not a legitimate son and never had the opportunity to take the reins of power in Wallachia. So I'm just going to leave him to the side for now. It doesn't seem like he has a whole lot to do with this story. Probably best for him that he has not a whole lot to do with this story. But nonetheless, there are three children involved. Now, Wallachia kind of, again, is between the, the Hungarian Empire and the Turks. So they're kind of the, the tug of war. There's this great push back and forth between the rulers of Eastern Europe and, again, the Islamic forces coming in through the Ottoman Empire. So Wallachia is definitely a fault over piece of land. And again, because it was common practice in Eastern Europe for kings and queens of one territory to give their children as collateral to another territory to show loyal ties, Vlad II, dad, decided to do the same thing with the Ottoman Empire. In fact, I think I'm just going to call Vlad II dad for now so that we don't get confused between Vlad III, which is who the famous impaler is, and his father, Vlad II. So Vlad II, from here on out, shall be called dad. So dad decides that he's going to take Vlad III and Radu, the younger son, to the Ottoman Empire. At this point, he is going to leave Vlad the third 
and Radu as, again, collateral to the Sultan. At this time, he also takes a loan from the Sultan. So this is also this is giving some sense of, of, of loyalty to the Ottoman Empire, and it's also for him to be able to pay back the debt that he borrowed from the Ottoman Empire. So I want to reiterate that for the Eastern Europeans, for Vlad III and his younger brother Radu, this was not uncommon. This wasn't some, like, traumatic thing that happened to them this was very much a common practice it had happened to dad earlier with his father with the hungarian court hence how he got initiated into the order of the dragon all that kind of stuff so vlad and his little brother radu were left at the palace of of the sultan um that's where they spent a lot of their formative years now before this vlad had been educated and trained as any nobleman any prince what if he was trained in the art of being a knight in military combat he was also given an education in reading and writing politics all that kind of stuff and, and this education continued into the sultan's court as well except for now he was also given an opportunity to study the quran all that kind of stuff again they were not held like they were hostages there was no prisoners of war stuff going on they were treated very well. They were treated as guests in, in the Ottoman Empire. Now, because dad decided to send his younger two sons to the Ottoman Empire to be held as collateral, to borrow money from the Sultan, and to show loyalty to the Sultan, this caused problems with the Empire of Hungary. Because again, remember, dad had been sent to hungary as a small boy where he was indeed initiated into the order of the dragon which supposedly was this like god squad that was going to push back against the incoming muslim forces so because dad had kind of turned his back on hungary and and instead had shown loyalty to the ottoman empire Hungary struck back while dad was traveling back from dropping off Vlad and Radu with the Sultan. The emperor, the king of Hungary had replaced dad with his cousin as the ruler of Wallachia. And we're not even going to get into his name because they're all, they all pretty much got the same fucking name. I just want to deliver a basic understanding of the tension and the and the trauma and the drama and the pettiness going on that leads up to the crux of this story, which is the curse. So we got cousin who's now sitting on the throne because dad decided to have an alliance with the Ottoman Empire. Dad comes back and is like, what's going on? The king of Hungary has now placed my fucking cousin on the throne, but I'm the king of Wallachia, so we have some problems. Now, remember, the oldest son, Mircha, who is named after granddad, is with dad because the oldest son is going to eventually inherit the throne. Now, it is important to note who the big ring gleaner of this kind of takeover from Hungary is. It's a man named Hunyadi. And Hunyadi is going to actually kind of be a little two-faced throughout. He's kind of going to weave in and out of this story. But Hunyadi, nonetheless, is like a, govern a governor regent of Hungary. And he is kind of the one that really steps in for the king and says, no, 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 this guy is turning our back is back on us so we're going to put his cousin on the on the throne and then hunyadi because there is a uh, actually there's anger right like like dad and an oldest brother mircha are like pissed because their dynasty is taken from them they're going to declare war on hunyadi meanwhile vlad and radu the younger boys are still hanging out in the sultan's palace learning the quran Tension is so bad between Hunyadi and dad and the oldest son that the oldest son, Mircha, is eventually taken held captive by Hunyadi. And not only is he held captive, but he has his eyes taken out by hot red pokers and then buried alive until he he died so this was an excruciating form of torture and form of death well of course dad is super pissed because his oldest son his child has now been 
executed in the most brutal way by Hunyadi, that he charges Hunyadi and is also captured and executed. And account accounts of how he was executed definitely vary. Some of the accounts say that he was beheaded and some say that he was burned alive. Nonetheless, he, the son and the dad are now gone. And so technically speaking, once the oldest son and the father are gone, Vlad III, who's down in the Ottoman Empire reading the Quran, is technically now the heir, the ruler of Wallachia. Well, at this point, Vlad and Radu don't know that this has gone on, right? Because this is not the age of, this is, this is the 1400s. There's no telephones, there's no email. It takes a while to get messages. But because dad and older brother are gone, Hunyadi from Hungary can keep cousin on the throne. Now, while Vlad and Radu are down at the Sultan's house, hanging out in the, with the Sultan, um, learning the Quran, Vlad is, is more of the complicated child. In fact, it is stated that Vlad does push back a lot from the teachings of the Ottoman Empire. But nonetheless, the Sultan and his family did truly love Vlad. And I think they kind of saw his, his temperament, his... Um, resistance to their teachings as adorable but radu the younger of the brothers who was often called radu the handsome very much took to the ways of the ottoman empire he very much found himself becoming more and more enchanted by the islamic faith and eventually did convert to islam it is also stated and rumored that radu probably was involved in a love affair, a homosexual love affair with the Sultan's son and heir to the Ottoman Empire. Remember that because that's going to come in handy later on in this story. Now, all this time before they even know that their father and their brother are dead and their cousin is ruling Wallachia, Vlad not only is pushing back against the Ottoman Empire and the Sultan, but he's also very annoyed by his brother Radu. He thinks his brother is being super ridiculous and is like kind of betraying this order of the dragon this dracula family because all the boys did carry the surname of dracula because their father had been initiated into this order that was supposed to pledge to protect eastern europe from the muslims so the fact that radu was so easily slipping into to this this cut cu these customs and this culture to the point where he was slowly changing his religion really annoyed vlad and i think too just the fact that they were siblings no one pisses you off more than your sibling right and just i, I could just see it now no matter what age we're in no matter what timeline we're in i could just see them like flicking each other and being pissed at each other because they're brothers and then the word came the message came that dad and older brother were now dead and cousin is now the ruler of Wallachia. Well, that was a bit too much. Like that was the straw that broke the camel's back for Vlad. At this point, because his father is dead, there is no need for the boys to stay as collateral with the Ottoman Empire. So Vlad decides that he is going to go into Wallachia at 17 years old to claim back his dynasty. The Ottoman Empire does provide Vlad with an army, with with men, with horses, in order for him to go on this journey. But Radu, on the other hand, his little brother, decides that he is going to stay. One thing we know that is clear about this time in Vlad's life is that he sees both Hungary and the Ottoman Empire as his enemy. I'm not 100% clear on why he sees the Ottoman Empire as his enemy, because again, he was treated relatively well by by the sultan and by his court um they were treated as guests and again this was not this was very common practice in eastern europe so it kind of rings to me that he might have been a little pissed that his brother was kind of turning his back on vlad and their heritage in order to hang out in the sultan's court it could have been because his brother maybe was gay i don't know it kind of seems like in a lot of ways that there was like more um personal tension and pettiness within himself like it wasn't necessarily a political grudge 
that he had against the Ottomans because his father had really set it up where they could be in good relationship with the Ottoman Empire. So hopefully the Ottoman Empire wouldn't try to take Wallachia. But nonetheless, Vlad III, the star of this story, now has an agenda, a vendetta, against Hungary, which, again, we can understand why he would have an agenda against Hungary, because Hungary killed his father and his brother, but I'm not quite sure why he has an, a vendetta against the Ottoman Empire, but that it is what it is. So let's start from the beginning. Hungary got mad at dad, at Vlad's father, because Vlad fought, Vlad, they saw Vlad's father as betraying Hungary for making a deal with the Ottomans. And then once dad was executed by Hungary for making the deal with the Ottomans, Vlad now comes in to claim back the throne. And now he's got a vendetta against both territories. I hope you're following me here. There's just a lot of anger. There's a lot of pettiness, a lot of family drama, because you know these guys are all like interrelated at the core. They're all like cousins of each other. So it's one big family fucking drama. And as I've said many times before, if I had to live during these times, I would hope to be a peasant because at least the peasants don't have to deal with this malarkey but there's just a lot it's it's a freaking soap opera there's so much going on but nonetheless vlad storms into Wallachia with his troops from the ottoman empire so the ottoman empire is supporting him even though he's mad at them to take back his throne and it does work temporarily this is now 1448. Again, Vlad is about 17 years old. He imposes his cousin. So he doesn't kill his cousin, not yet anyway. He just imposes him, takes the throne back. And then we see the first of what would become what Vlad the Impaler was known for, and that is impaling his enemies. At this point, he knew that the noblemen of Wallachia had a lot to do with snitching to the Hungarian court that got his father taken off the throne and his cousin put on, which then led to his father's death. So he decides, once he's now taken the throne back, to invite all the noblemen to the castle for a dinner now people might say weren't they suspicious because these were the noblemen as they say that were directly or vlad felt like were directly responsible and i to that i say no they probably weren't suspicious because noblemen in all over europe eastern europe western europe noblemen were constantly coming in and out of court which is the court is the castle right they're constantly in with the king so this is nothing that's that's unusual so they come into the castle to have this dinner with with vlad the third who's now the new ruler of Wallachia, and this is where we see or allegedly we see the first signs of vlad impaling people he takes all the noblemen and he impales them if you don't know what that means they take like a spike and stick it up through your middle bit all the way up through your head apparently it takes like three days sometimes to to die of impalement now vlad did learn this technique uh from the ottomans this was not a technique that was typically done in any anywhere in europe in europe people mostly were like beheaded or burned at the stake but impaling was specifically something that was done by the turks in the ottoman empire so we know that this was a trait that he picked up from the turks but for the eastern europeans the people of wallachia for the people of hungary this was this was horrific because this was definitely not something people were used to seeing and he he scattered his impaled noblemen kind of around wallachia as a warning for all the other people in in places of power like don't cross me because i will impale you this is also kind of a warning to the people of hungary because again vlad has a vendetta he is coming after those who destroyed his family uh, eventually vlad gets kind of ousted he has to go into exile because what the fuck like you're impaling people no so he gets moved he goes into exile in a country a territory called moldavia moldavia is ruled by vlad's uncle i'm telling you guys like they're all cousins right they all know each other they're all family and so for a few years he's in moldavia with uncle 
and with his cousin. His cousin is a man named Stephen. And Vlad and Stephen become very close comrades, right? They end up helping each other out a lot. Because what's going to happen, you see, as uncle, Vlad's uncle, is also going to be executed and removed from the throne of Moldavia. So both cousin Stephen and Vlad now have to run for their lives together. And as they run back into the Wallachia territory, they get help from none other than the man who is instrumental in having Vlad's dad and older brother killed. At this point, Hunyadi, the governor of Hungary, needs Vlad. He recognizes that he needs Vlad because the Ottoman Empire is definitely gaining momentum to start to make their way into Eastern Europe. And because Vlad has a relationship with the Ottoman Empire, Hunyadi believes that he can use Vlad as a way to kind of negotiate a, a truce with the Ottomans. Now, Hunyadi is, I don't think he quite understands that Vlad is not a fan of the Ottoman Empire, but there is connections, right? He grew up there in captivity there and his brother is still there. Meanwhile, Vlad's cousin is still on the throne in Wallachia, but he's but Vlad himself and his cousin, his other cousin, Stephen, the good cousin, well, I guess kind of good cousin, Vlad's good cousin, the cousin, the cousin who's on Vlad's good side, are working with Hunyadi to try to push back against the Ottomans, but the other cousin, the bad cousin, is still on the throne of Wallachia. Does this make sense to you guys? It's, it's crazy. You thought your family had problems. Can you imagine a Thanksgiving with this family? On May 9th of 1453, there was a shot heard around the world. And I kind of mean this, even though there is a shot heard around the world, I kind of mean this literally and figuratively because at this time gunpowder is being used and 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 kind of experimented with which Vlad will get into playing with gunfire but nonetheless on this date the new sultan so the the sultan's son who grew up with Vlad and Radu Radu's lover so Vlad's pseudo brother-in-law <laughs> takes over Constantinople. And up until this point, Constantinople had been a stronghold for Eastern European, for the Christian world. But once they take over Constantinople, all bets are off. This was a huge loss for the Eastern Europe. Now, the, the, the many cathedrals in Constantinople that were quote-unquote Christian are now turned into Islamic mosque. We see this battle still today in that part of the world. And to make matters worse, Constantinople became Came at that point kind of the capital city for now the Turks. This was a huge, huge threat to Eastern Europe. But Vlad, for all Vlad's faults, for all the psychotic stuff that Vlad ends up doing, you know, the serial killer in him, um, he is scrappy. Like he's scrappy. He he's quick. He he's obviously a very intelligent lad. And he he gets himself out of some jams. I, I got to give him that. Like, the dude really knew how to, like, in very clever ways, get himself out of, like, these jams. And so while the threat of the Turks are imposing themselves on Eastern Europe, Vlad kind of strikes up this, this deal with Hunyadi. He talks other territories into going to battle with Hungary, with Hunyadi, to push back against the Turks. So they're like distracted doing that while Vlad stays behind and goes head to head with his cousin, the bad cousin, who's on the throne of Wallachia. And there is a huge story around this. Apparently, Vlad like challenges his, his cousin, bad coming to like hand to hand combat. And he kills him. And so now Vlad is the undisputed ruler of Wallachia. At this point, his good cousin, cousin Stephen, also now becomes the ruler of Moldovia, which they end up having each other's back throughout this whole ordeal of their lives, really supporting each other. And in some really fucked up world i think it's kind of cool that he at least had one family member that was totally 
behind him and never betrayed him. That's not saying much because I do believe that Vlad was a total psychopath. I think a lot of them were. Again, he will end up becoming one of the world's worst serial killers that ever existed. But nonetheless, at this point, where we are in the story, this is his second reign. He is now the undisputed ruler of Wallachia, and he really starts to amp up his Vladness, his Draculaness at this point. He starts to fortify walls all over Wallachia to keep the Ottomans totally out. And he really amps up his method of torture of impalement. Now, before it had just been a, a punishment for the nobles for what he considered to be treason, for turning his father and brother, uh, you know, over, overthrowing them basically off the throne and then in, as a result having them killed. And so he felt like that was justified form of treason during his first reign. But now he's basically, it seems like he's basically starting to impale people who just piss him off. He starts at first, again, seizing land from the remaining nobles who betrayed his father, and he gave the land to some of his allies. He impales, of course, the nobles. He puts the bodies around the territory to warn people. He also impaled women and children. He also had people eaten alive. It is said that he would cook body parts in front of people so if your dad is impaled he would like have a body part cut, uh, cut off and cooked and he would eat it in front of you he also would take out his aggression a lot on women he was very uh weird about sexuality and if it was believed that a woman had not been uh chased had not um, remained a virgin until her wedding day he would impale women alive with a hot iron spike and he would cut off their breast or or something on their body and cook it and force the lover who did the deed with the woman to eat it in front of her while she was dying this man is fucking crazy like i i mean now, many people will say some of these more extreme stories were rumors and exaggerations. It could have been a rumor created by the Hungarian court or other courts to basically propaganda to kind of sell the story that Vlad was just this maniac. It could have been propaganda created by Vlad himself to make him scary to his enemies. But I'm, I'm kind of on more of the side that that where there's smoke there's fire and if these stories have been around for such a long time and we do know for sure that he was into really extreme forms of punishment that they're probably true they're, they're these are not pro these are i'm guessing these are not propaganda this is not fake news i'm thinking this is probably true others that are like me and believe this is true a lot of them are, are say a lot that that, that he's we're uncertain his, his wrath of terror, definitely, there's a lot of uncertainty. We don't know how far his wrath of t terror actually went. To some people of this area to this day, he is considered to be one of the most disgusting human beings to ever uh, walk the face of the earth. To others, though, he is considered to be a national hero because he really fought to take back the land for for the people of this area, which I, I don't know, you know, I'm not from that area, so I really can't speak on that, but doesn't, doesn't seem like Vlad was super interested in the people. It seemed like he was more interested in the power and himself. This seems very much like a uh, narcissism in psychopathy that was probably triggered by his parent, his dad's death and his brother's death, but got out of hand. So I don't know, Wallachia, Romania. I, I don't know, man. I don't know if he really cared about your ancestors who were peasants. And I think he was more in this for himself. Meanwhile, the sultan of the new sultan of the Ottoman Empire, Radu, his little brother's lover, Vlad's pseudo brother-in-law decides that Wallachia is now a part of the Ottoman Empire. He makes this decision without even invading. He just goes, knock, knock, here we are. Now you're part of us. He does this by saying, sending men to the court of Vlad and demanding payment, like, like taxes for the Ottoman Empire. And at first, Vlad is like, well, if you're going to come into my court, aren't you going to take your turbans off while you greet me? 
And the men are like, no, we're not taking our turbans off. So Vlad decides that because they will not take their turbans off to greet him properly, he gets his men, his cronies, to drill nails in their head so they can't get the turbans off. After that, Vlad, of course, impales them. And then Vlad decides, you know what? I haven't seen that sultan since we were youngsters growing up in the palace together. And, you know, I haven't seen my brother in a while. So I think I'm going to take a nice little trip down to the Ottoman Empire and just be like, what's up, homie? Like, why are you, why are you saying my land's your land? Like, that's not cool. Like, no, it's my land. So that's what he does. Vlad goes to the Ottoman Empire. As Vlad gets into the Ottoman territory, he decides that he is going to make a really grand entrance. And so he gets his new toy, this new toy called gunpowder, and decides to start blowing shit up. For about 500 miles into the Ottoman Empire, Vlad goes on a killing spree into villages, killing men, women, and children, even in those days. To go in and kill women and children was like, you were like, that was like not honorable. And that's kind of nice to know that at least in those days of more barbaric means of attack, at least in most cases, women and children were off limits. But not to Vlad. No one was off limits to Vlad. At this point, the Sultan of the Ottoman Empire, Vlad's old buddy from childhood and his brother's lover decides that, you know what? I don't think Vlad should be on the throne of Wallachia. I'm claiming Wallachia is mine, but I'm going to put Radu, my lover, Radu, Vlad's little brother on the throne. I think Radu should be on the throne because at least my lover will help me join forces and take Wallachia as mine. So the Sultan plans with his men to go up the Danube River to the part of the Danube that was owned by Wallachia. And that's where they were going to enter the country. And this was in May of 1462. Now the Sultan did eventually get to Vlad's castle. Remember how I said earlier that Vlad was scrappy? This is another instance of him being scrappy. Vlad and his people at the court, his wife, his children, his servants, everybody that works for him are kind of held up in this castle. And it, it became apparent that the Sultan was going to try to starve Vlad out. Vlad was way outnumbered. I mean, this is the fucking Ottoman Empire. A part of me is kind of shocked at the audacity that Vlad had to try to take down the Ottoman Empire. But nonetheless, I'm not going to disparage him for his courage in trying to do that. But you know, like, he was outnumbered by, by a lot. Like, this is an empire, right? And so Vlad comes up with a plan. Vlad dresses up in um, clothes that make him look like part of the Ottoman Empire. Of course, he knows how they dress, right? He grew up at the Sultan's pa palace. And so he dresses like these men and he sneaks out into their camps and he tells a bunch of men like, hey, it's going to be chaotic tonight. And the Sultan wants you to stay in your tent. So if you hear chaos happening outside, just stay in your tent. We don't want to avoid confusion. It's part of the plan, blah, blah, blah. So then Vlad goes back into the castle, gets his man. His, his goal is to get to the tent where the Sultan is so he can stab the Sultan in the heart and that will scare off all the Ottoman Empire and then boom, he's got his territory again. Well, the men attack. They go in. It's, it is a surprise attack because all these other Ottoman dudes, these Turks, are like sitting in their tent because that's what they think they're supposed to do. While meanwhile, they're being slaughtered by Vlad's people. Well, unfortunately, Vlad does not find the Sultan. The Sultan was in a completely different camp. So at this point, Vlad rightly so panics. He's got to move because he there's no way that he's going to be able to now take on the Sultan and win. Vlad's wife at this point is so desperate as to what's going on that she jumps out of the castle to her death so now there's another body another person of someone vlad loves that he now blames on somebody else and so that's just another tick to his vendetta against these people vlad and his men sneak out of the castle and so when the ottomans get to the area beyond the castle they find it to be desolate 
as they start moving deeper into the next town with the desolation, they come upon a forest. And this is a forest of impaled people that in one last failed ditch effort are supposed to try to scare off the Sultan and the Ottomans. Meanwhile, we have to remember that the Ottoman, a flag learned impalement from the Ottomans. I mean, they, they know this. They're not, they're used to seeing this. Vlad eventually makes his way into Hungary, where he's hoping he can strengthen his alliance with the Hungarians against the Ottomans. Since Vlad has now deserted Wallachia, the Sultan goes, oh, okay, well, Radu, now you're the king. So Radu is now sitting on the throne of Wallachia, and in 1462, with Vlad in Hungary, he is now taken captive. Vlad came to Hungary for help. His brothers on the throne, for all intents and purposes, the Ottoman Empire now have Wallachia. And he goes into Hungary and he's like, yo, I need to like get my alliance with you guys because I'm in trouble. And Matthias Corvinius decides instead of giving him sanctuary or helping him take his country back from the Ottomans, which everyone in Eastern Europe is scared of the Ottomans, he decides he's going to take vlad prisoner now n historians still don't quite understand why old matthias did this it's still not clear they do know that matthias was trying to become the holy roman emperor at the time and they do believe that this was kind of like a political move for matthias which is still really confusing because the whole point of the holy roman emperor and, and and like this whole time when we had the crusades now we're out of the crusades but another crusade is going to start soon it's all about like protecting christendom from the muslims so you would think that if vlad was as awful as vlad was that if he was coming in and being like i need your help against the muslims then Matthias wanting to be the Holy Roman Empire would have like been like, sure, dude, like seeing this as like a sign from God to like go against the Muslim. It's just very confusing. And I'm very glad that many historians I listened to researching for this episode basically said, we don't know why he did this. This makes no sense to us whatsoever as to why he took him prisoner. But nonetheless, he did. Vlad was kept a prisoner for Matthias and Hungary for about 14 years. Now, the positive, like, silver lining of this situation is Vlad did find himself a second wife. But then eventually, old cousin Stephen, who's ruler of Mol Moldavia, comes over and kind of gets flat out like come on dude we're going home this is stupid matthias like let him go we don't know what you're doing and so he he goes with his cousin steve and like vlad is back baby so vlad picks up this like ragtag army because he hasn't been in wallachia for 14 years his brother radu was put on the throne so it's the same family on the throne but by this time radu had actually passed away so another bozo is sitting on the throne now and so vlad with his ragtag army comes marching back into wallachia to take back what is his the bozo who is now sitting on the throne of wallachia sees vlad and his ragtag army coming in and he basically shat his pants and ran away so it was probably one of the easiest takeovers of vlad had ever had in his life and, and i don't i don't blame him like if i saw vlad the impaler coming for me i would probably show my pants and run away too but by this point by the third reign of vlad wallachia has basically been used and abused not just by vlad but by the ottomans by the hungarians by all this war again you have hungary and the ottomans and you have this tug of war going on with wallachia right in the center there's no more resources uh vlad basically has no real army he's basically a shit out of luck at this time and this is when the legend of the curse of vlad dracula is said to have been created there apparently is a document that vlad signed stating his intention to curse 
these people, the people that he felt like had betrayed him because he knew at this point his days were numbered. He knew that the Ottoman Empire would eventually be coming back into Wallachia and back to try to take over and there was no way that Vlad was going to be able to stand up against the Sultan. At this point he had lost both his brothers, his father, his wife, and more importantly his dynasty. He signed a document to bring a curse against his enemies and he assured them that he would return after death to exact that promise and that curse. Two months later, the Sultan invaded Wallachia. Vlad Dracula, Vlad the Impaler, Vlad the Third, whatever you want to call him, was killed. It is said that he was beheaded and that his head was sent back to the Ottoman Empire drenched in honey to be adored by the Turks as a prize for him finally being conquered. His body, however, was buried in a nearby monastery. But in recent history, his tomb was exhumed and there was nothing in it. Many people believe to this day that Vlad the Impaler, Vlad Dracula, who had such a bloodlust, who was of the order of the dragon, the son of the devil, never truly died. That he was a vampire in himself, and he was able to keep everlasting life, and to keep his reign of terror going against those that he felt had wronged him. But sometimes I suspect there's another option as to why his body is gone. As we know from all of our recent studies of these bodies that have gone missing, we know that in the dark occult, they like to take body parts of people that they feel like were enigmas, people that had a certain je ne sais quoi about them, a magic to them, whether that magic was for good or for bad. And they take part of their bodies and use an essence of the body in rituals in order, in order to harness the energy of that person. Could it be that the rest of Vlad's body was taken by people who practice in the dark arts? Possibly. But I do think it's interesting to note that the English royal family who sits on the throne right now are descendants of Vlad the Impaler. And some of the stories, some of the rumors that we have heard about them are very, very similar to the stories we heard about Vlad. All right, you guys, let me know your thoughts and your opinions down in the comment section below. What are your... Why do you, I mean, y'all, his body's gone. Like, is he, a, is he a vampire? Like, is he turning into bats and flying around and drinking blood of people? Or is his body being used at this moment for certain types of witchcraft and occult practices? I don't know. All we know is his body's gone. No one knows where his body is. The tomb is there. The body's not. Body's not there. So let me know what you think. Also, please join us if you can over on Aquarius Rising Africa this morning at 9 a.m. Eastern Time. We're going to be discussing this again live. I always put this up an, an hour or two before I go on with Aquarius Rising Africa to give you time to like hear the story and do a quick little research for yourself so that you can join in in the conversation. Because again, it's not just going to be me. It's going to be Shanti and Mornay up there on the screen. And then, of course, we have the live chat going so you guys can continue contribute to this story as well. You know, it's like knowledge is power, knowledge protects. The more we look at this, the more we understand that these things happen for whatever reason, we can be better prepared to protect ourselves from the more nefarious side of this world. But beyond that, you guys, I hope you're having a wonderful day. I hope you're gearing up for the Christmas season and I will talk to you all soon. Bye everybody.
Just ahead of us.